those of you watching on television, we'd love for you to come join us here at Antioch on Sunday morning. For those of you that are here in person, let's all stand for the reading of God's word. This morning we're going to begin Romans 8, 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Father, we ask you to anoint this word today. That, Father, you just bless it and help us to understand our situation and what we're here for and how we should be and to accept our failures, Father, as part of growth in Jesus. Lead us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody be seated. You know, the Bible said that you're the creature. We're the creatures. We were made subject to vanity. And that word vanity means that just this life right here on earth, I'm telling you, folks, it's worthless. You can make millions of dollars, and you're going to die one day and leave that behind. Right. You can be Arnold the Barbarian, and you know what? One day you're going to be a shriveled up old man, sick, and on sugar diabetes medicine. It's all temporary here, y'all. But you see, God said we wasn't willingly subjected to this, but we were subjected to this for a purpose, and that's to mold you and to shape you and to just let this vanity beat us down, and we defeat it through Jesus. And then we get to heaven, we're going to be fit for heaven. That's what it's all about. He's shaping you. This is a boot camp. And he's getting you ready to live in heaven. We're sold under sin, folks. That's what this is saying. You're not going to be perfect as long as you're living in a body made of dirt. Because you're sold under sin. Well, what's the purpose of that? Well, God sold us under sin. He allowed us to succumb to sin so it could beat us down. And he could pick us up. It could beat us down, and we'd fight against it. Beat us down, get us back. It's a learning and a growing and a con- You know what the iron? You know you sharpen a knife, you beat it on steel. And the more you hit that iron on that home, the sharper that iron gets. And that's what this is all about. You've been subjected to beating because God is sharpening you, getting you ready to be sharp enough to live in heaven. Amen. Woo! What a blessing. And listen, Ephesians one three says something right here. Blessed be the God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Folks, don't you know something? When you go through something bad with a health problem, financial, marital, whatever it is, bless God for it because he is conditioning you to sit in heavenly places. He is conditioning you and I that we're going to live in a heavenly place. It's worth whatever you go through. Trust me. Trust the word. Whatever misery you go through, Because you see, folks, listen here. It goes on in verse 4 of Ephesians 1. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be a holy and without blame before him in love. You see, this whole plan of the Garden of Eden, it kills me when people will say, well, he didn't know we was going to eat. Sure, he knew we was going to eat that fruit. This was all a plan before the first grain of sand was ever made. When God was in heaven and Lucifer betrayed him, God said, I'm going to make me a little creature. I'm going to condition him when I bring him up here. He'll never betray me like Lucifer did. That's why we're here. That's what we're being trained for. One day, you go stand in front of the throne of God. Even though we sin every day, you're going to be blameless. Why? Because the blood of Jesus washed all your iniquity away. And you see, that way, it might sound kind of odd, but God has set it up purposely. That you and I can sin and fall. But he's there to get you back up. And you, every time you get up, you've learned something from it. You know, I always tell the kids, it's, it's one thing to sin. But if you don't learn nothing from it, then it just hurts you. You see, when you and I succumb to sin, but we learn something about it, well, then we're one up on the devil. And over a lifetime, you get to where you're pretty shrewd when it comes to sin. How's the Bible said? We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. Not by a long shot. We figured him out a long time ago. But God has chosen us for something. And you know what? To live, listen, Ephesians 1, 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. God, he's got even a family. We're his kids. By Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You know something? All this stuff we're going through is because God, it pleases him. He wants you to be in heaven with him as his children. We're called the bride of Christ. We're called a lot of things like that. 
But God wants you to understand he has adopted us. Through the death of Jesus, you can be a child of God, which one day you will live with God. What a day that's going to be. And you know what? It's all there because of the pleasure of his will. We just can't comprehend how God loves family. He's got so much love to give. And he needs somebody he can love. And I'll tell you what, I want to be an applicant for that job. Amen. I want all the love God can give me. And this is how it's going to be in Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say to them on the right hand, that's you. Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Oh, folks, God's been working on. You know, I've always said it. If God could build Colorado and Hawaii and all these in seven days, well, actually six, he was through. Just think what your mansion's going to be. He's been working on it for 2,000 years. Oh, folks, we can't comprehend that. But you know what? I know it gets hard. I know we got people with bombs right now. Right now, Russia and China, they're teaming up on us. Right now, America is in big trouble. We're in jeopardy. But Jesus said, don't you be afraid of all of that junk. That's just what's got to happen before I come get you and take you home. And that's why he tells us right here in Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid, <coughs> but <clears throat> instead, look at the big picture. We might go through some hard, grievous times, but it's God conditioning you to give you his kingdom. Boy, I know right now we don't, there's a lot of things we don't have. But when you get to heaven, you're going to have it all. Yes, indeed. Life is hard, but you can do it. Listen to this now. Now, you've got to listen because there's a battle going on. I want you to understand that today. Between your flesh and sin and the Holy Ghost, there is a war going on in your life. Today, we need to be aware of that war. Now, listen. Galatians 5, 16 gives us the key to success. This I say then, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, God has warned us about this battle and this conditioning. And he wants you to be able to handle it. So listen what he says here in Galatians. In Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you'd like to do. You cannot be perfect even though you'd like to. There's habits you can't break. and I mean, it just takes a lifetime of trying and trying and failing and trying and failing and trying. I've known people that's give up smoking a hundred times, but thank God they're still trying. See, that's what, that's what matters. God don't want to see, I mean, I said don't want, God don't expect to see you have victory and be perfect, but he really wants to see how hard you're trying to be. That's what it boils down. It's in here. Right. Well, you know what? But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, you see, folks, that is so important to you and I. In order for us to learn and for that iron to be struck upon that home, we've got to sin. We've got to fall. And what God is telling you, you're not under the law anymore. If you tell a lie, well, you immediately you're going to ask Jesus to forgive you because you're a Christian. But as a Christian washed in the blood, that lie, you're not under the law. You're not accountable, spiritually speaking, anymore. It's kind of complicated because you go rob a liquor store and you'll see how accountable you are. <laughs> but when it comes to our soul, that's been bought and paid for. It belongs to God. And he done that for a purpose so we could go through this conditioning without being condemned to hell. So he lifted the law and said, now you do the best you can. And I'm going to make up the rest. And when I call you to heaven, you'll be ready for heaven. Hey, that's a good deal, man. Well, but now we are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Folks, you know what? You don't come to church, and I don't want you to come to church because you have to you come because you want to. Amen. People call me, well, brother, I didn't come to church yesterday because blah, blah. I don't need to know that. I'm not going to get on you for not coming to church. I want you to look forward to coming to church, not worry that Brother Russell could get mad if I don't go to church. I want you to want to come here and enjoy it. And when you leave, 
I'm hoping you're thinking, boy, that's, that ended too quick. I hope you want more when you walk out that door. But you see, that's what this means. Well, I know it'd be against the law for me to kill Tush there. But I don't need to know that because I love him and I wouldn't want to hurt a hair. Well, sorry about that, Tush. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to hurt his scalp. Amen. I wouldn't want to put a bruise on his scalp because I like the guy. That's what God's trying to tell us. Don't do it because you got to. Do it because you want to. And that's what this is all about. When God gets through conditioning you and I, we'll understand that more and more. Well, listen what this says in Romans seven fourteen. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I, well, I'm carnal. I'm sold under sin. That flat out means you ain't going to be what you want to be if it's good because we are just fighting a battle. And as long as you're in the flesh, you're not going to win it. Now listen to what Paul says. He said, you know, I preach one thing, but I get out there and by golly, I forget all about it. Romans 7, 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that I do not, but what I hate, that I do. Now, let me try to put this in today's terms. Apostle Paul pulls up to a red light, four cars in front of him. He's in a hurry. He's running late. And the light turns green, and he looks up there, and the lady's on the phone. And she's still on the phone, and we're waiting. And just before the light turns red, she takes off, and Apostle Paul and all them guys are still sitting in line. Well, see, he don't represent a very good apostle at that point because he succumbed to the flesh. Doggone it, I tell people not to blow up and explode at a red light and here I am, I'm doing it. That's what this is saying because I can't help it. <laughs> if then I do that which I would not, I consent under the law that it's good and you know what? It'll keep you in line. The Ten Commandments will show you what you should and shouldn't do. You shouldn't steal, you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't want to kill somebody because they don't take off at a red light. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. See, what he's doing, he's separating your soul that belongs to God, bought with a price, from that flesh that is just beating you down every day. That's what he's showing us. Listen to what he says in Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me that is my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with thee, but how to perform that which is good, I can't find a way to do it. Oh, doesn't that make sense? Now watch this. <clears throat> well, the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that's what I do. Well, if I do that which I would not, it's no more that I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Now, I find a law in verse 21, a fact of life, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And I've said this a million times, a million times. You make up your mind, you're going to be in church every Sunday morning. You'll work overtime. You'll be extra sleepy. You won't feel good. Evil will be there to stop you. Start a new diet, and tomorrow Bonnie will bring you some donut holes. It never fails. And I'm, I, I appreciate it, Bonnie. Because I did regulate those. I didn't eat them all in one night. Jerry did. Well, anyway, but I got on her the next day. I made her walk an extra mile. I'm making that up, y'all do know that. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You know something? Man, I love what the Bible says and, and loving each other and just always being good and loving God and coming to church. I love that. But when it, the rubber hits the road, it kind of changes, don't it? When our flesh gets in the picture, it but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. It don't get no clearer than that, does it? And you know something? Here's the question of the century. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know what? You got all these self-righteous people with their nose in the air. If it rained, they would drown. They think they're better than everybody. But this is the Apostle Paul, and he says, Oh, wretched beast that I am. Who in the world is going to save me from this body of this defeat? Well, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Folks, 
I know so many people that will not even try to go to church because they think they just can't reach that goal. Folks, there's no goal to reach. <laughs> Jesus done exceeded that goal for you. If you ask him to be your Lord and Savior, you get his benefits, his trophies, and his plaques because he done it for you. I'm glad because I can't do it myself. You see, listen what this says. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful unto me. You know what? He says, hey, I'm, I'm done immune to Ten Commandments. It's all lawful for me. I can do it. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Again, I say, all things are lawful. You're saved. You're bought by the blood. But you start drinking, you'll be an alcoholic. You start smoking, you'll get emphysema. You start smoking them crack rocks, rocks you'll be a zombie. Things have consequences. Jesus bought your soul, but he didn't fix it to where you're immune to the consequences of a rotten life. You'll pay the price. You're lazy, you won't have nothing. <laughs> but you see, folks, what I'm getting at is this right here, this one line in 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And you know what? We owe him that. Folks, if you only knew what he's got prepared for you and I. Oh, and like I said before, this life in this world is hard. Nobody's denying that. But if you and I could get a glimpse, just a glimpse of where we're going, you'd have a different attitude. Well, and this is why Ephesians 2, 6, he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and of his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You know, there was a tragedy happening just the other day, and a guy told the fellow that the tragedy happened. He says, how can there be a God when things like this happen? Well, folks, folks first of all, the Garden of Eden and us eating the fruit is why tragedies happen. It ain't God's fault. We, we made it that way. But then again, when you read this, we're going to sit in heavenly places one day with God, live where God lives, and never, never think of death again. All the things we go through in this world, you're going to say that was worth every bit of it because look where we are today. He's going to show us in the ages to come, the ages and ages, for eternity, God is just going to bless us and spoil us rotten. But make no mistake about it. You're not saved today because you quit sinning. Because you didn't. You and I are not saved because we earned a place in heaven because God don't owe nobody nothing. Amen. But here it is in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved, and it's only through faith. First, let's talk about grace. Grace is to neutralize sin. Grace is something that is free, and you don't deserve it. Your driver's license expires. You've got a 10-day grace period. You break in the law but they cut you some slack. Well, you and I are sinners, and make no mistake about it, we sin every day. But God's grace says, I'm going to not only ignore that sin, my son's going to wash it away. That's what grace is. And it's only done through faith, not your money and your offering plate, not your work, not your good deeds, not you that you quit sinning. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. Simple. Do you believe he died and rose from the dead? The Bible says if you say that with your mouth and tell him, he'll save you. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man wants to brag about it. For we are his workmanship. Jesus gets all the glory. <clears throat> Created in Christ Jesus for, that word for means, unto means for, for the purpose of good works, which God hath before ordained that we should Walk in them. Yes, you're above the Ten Commandments because of Jesus, but you should walk in the goodness of God. Live it. Show it. You are the only Bible some people will ever read. Let them see that you got a, a holiness about you. But you know what? Listen to this. Some people got the idea, well, and you know what? I got to say this. These fools, you Baptists think you got a license to sin. No, not, not hardly. Our Jesus has freed us from the penalty of sin and hell. 
But listen what the Bible says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue and say that grace may abound? Well, let's get our money's worth. No, not hardly. Listen. <coughs> God forbid. How shall we that are dead in sin live any longer there? How in the world can you know that Jesus died and suffered on a cross to free you from sin, yet you relish sin and you wallow in it? Well, that don't make any sense. Well, you mean that you're saved, and if you sin, you're still saved, and you just keep sinning? And Well, it's kind of like this example I always give. Your mother loves you, and you could probably slap her right across the face, and she'd still love you. Your daddy'd kill you, but your mama'd still love you. But is there anybody in here who would want to slap their mama? Not hardly, not, if, not unless you're a piece of scum. You see, folks, what I'm trying to say is, yeah, you know, there's a law that says you don't do it, but then again, you wouldn't think of doing it. And that's, that's what God is trying to show us today. How shall we sin when we're dead to it because of Jesus? How can we live in it? Know ye not that as many of you were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into his death. You see, folks, that's why we get baptized in this tank of water, to show that that old sinner has died and a new person has been raised to walk a new life. Don't mean you're not going to sin no more, but it means you've been changed. That's what it means. Wherefore, Romans 6, 4, we're buried with him and baptized him into death, that like as Jesus was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. When we were lost, we were a, had a different attitude, a different personality, went to different places, done different things. But when you got the Holy Spirit, your attitude changed. Your lifestyle changed. Your friends even changed. Therefore, if any man, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Them old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's true, y'all. That's true. <coughs> but make sure you understand something. This change is because you got Jesus in your heart. You don't change to get Jesus. You change because you got him. And we've got to understand that there's nobody ever going to go to heaven because they follow the Ten Commandments to the letter because nobody's ever done that except Jesus himself. So if you depend on following the deeds of the law, you forget that because you break that every day. You don't love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, every fiber of your being. I know I can't. I don't love my neighbors. That means everybody with all my heart and soul like I love myself, not hardly. But listen what this says in Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know how I know I'm a sinner? Because I look in the Bible and I broke every one of those rules. And I break them to this day. Well, you don't kill nobody. The Bible said when you get so mad at somebody you hate them. For just a minute. You just soon. Well, you doesn't just soon. But it's the same as killing. You'd like to. And even if you get above that, my sins nailed Jesus to the cross, so I'm guilty there anyway. You see, the Ten Commandments has given us, the law was given so you could see that we need Jesus. That's the only reason. It was never given to us to follow it. You can't follow it. It was given to us to show, okay, you can't follow it, but I got somebody that can and did and will, and he'll save you. And let me read that to you. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Well, but after faith has come and you've been saved, we're no longer under that schoolmaster. You know, I read about Apostle Paul. He had a problem. It doesn't really say what it was. Some people say that there were certain people he didn't like, and he just could, kind of like Jonah going to Nineveh. He didn't like Ninevites and couldn't help it. But he comes to God and he said, God, I've got a problem and I pray to you three times and you won't take it from me. Now, a lot of people say it was a sickness. That ain't in the Bible. But let me read this to you right here. Um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, means he wrote most of the Bible. He could easily got a big head. But God let him have a little bit of sin to fight with to constantly remind him, brother, you ain't nothing but dirt. You do what I tell you and you follow me and 
we'll get by, but don't think he's somebody. That's the same for me and you. <laughs> Lest I should be exalted. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times I prayed about it, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Grace never is there to cover sickness. Grace covers sin. It says the grace covers a multitude of sin, but it's not for sickness. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities, my problems, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Folks, you hear what he's saying? Whenever I've got problems and I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. You know why? Because I know I need Jesus. If I thought I could do it on my own, I'd be cocky and think I've got it together. But I know I can't do it on my own. So I'm humble instead of cocky, and I depend on God for my every breath. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, and necessities, and persecutions, and distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. And that is so true. You know, I've known people that, you know, boy, everything in life be going good. And next thing you know, they kind of start missing church on Sunday. And then you see them, and they don't go at all. They don't pray no more. It's funny how a child can get real sick, and all of a sudden they're religious again. You see, folks, what that means is you're trying to use God, and it don't work that way. We need to be right with God all the time and understand that we are weak. We don't need God just when our babies are sick or just when we get a bad report from the doctor. We need him all the time. And you'll stay strong. In Romans 3.23, it just puts, it just lays it on a line for all to sin and come short of the glory of God. Period. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Again, folks, I can't say it enough. It's free. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, an appeasement, a sacrifice through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the washing away, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now, folks, I know I can't stand before God without righteousness but I don't have none. But Jesus has got more than enough for all of us. Thank you, Jesus. And I stand here today and I declare his righteousness upon me. That's my righteousness. <laughs> yes, yeah, this is so good. God is so good. Well, where's boasting in? I know a lot of people brag about how good they are. Oh, what confused people. It's excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we concluded that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Thank God a weak creature like me, made subject to vanity, I can fail and get back up again and every day. But you see, this right here said, it's concluded. I'm justified by faith. Not by being perfect. I want to be perfect, but I can't. I try. I just can't seem to find that which is good. But I found that which is best, and his name's Jesus. And he'll save you, he'll save me, he'll save anybody that asks. I've had people over the years, well, Brother Russell, I've just sinned too much, he won't save me. Yes, he will. He'll save anybody that asks him to. He loves you that much that he gave his last drop of blood to buy you. Do you understand today Jesus bought you with coins of pain? And you got him and he said, now you mine ain't nothing going to get you out of my hand. We owe him so much. But what I'm telling you today is when you slam your finger in the car door and you say a nasty word, don't think you're going to hell now. That's part of the growing process. You say a nasty word, you say, Lord, I am sorry I said that ugly word. Please forgive me in the name of Jesus. Immediately, you do that. You see, here's the deal, folks. If you don't do it, you're going to heaven. But you open the door for the devil to come in and give you a black eye tomorrow. Keep your slate clean. Keep it fresh. I tell you, we owe Jesus so much. It's hard to believe today that the war, I was watching Franklin Graham this morning on the news saying how people are falling away from Christianity in droves, man. 
and most of them are going to Buddhism or, or the Muslim religion, Islam. They're going to stuff, Hinduism. None of those can give you eternal life, and none of them claim to. They don't even claim to. But Jesus said, all them that follow me, they'll never die. I'm going to give them my kingdom, and boy, we're going to have a party. Oh, I tell you, folks, I look forward to that. When I get depressed about this world and this life, I just think about, hang on. Hang on, folks, because we got something coming. That when you see them pearly gates, you're just you're going to be in awe. And you're going to keep saying to yourself, is this real? Can this be real? It is real. One day, you're going to live there. Let's pray. Father in glory, we thank you so much for your truth this morning. <clears throat> we ask, Lord God, for as one who that's lost and never been saved, they come and let me pray with them. But Father, I ask you to show them in their heart that we can be saved in a sycamore tree or in our bed at home or sitting at a red light. Father, we just ask that you just touch our hearts and open our eyes to the truth to know that, Lord, you paid the price. And we're saved by grace. It's not up to us to keep it or to hold on to it. You're holding on to us. We love you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everyone.